Welcome everyone. Today we're going to be looking at um, obviously some uh, rotoscoping techniques and let's, let's take a quick look at the, the shot that we've got uh, to look for here. I mean it's a fairly simple little shot. There's, there's not too much uh, going on in terms of people running around on fire but actually the, the techniques that we're going to be looking at today um, will stand you in good stead for, uh, for a lot of other um, uh, sort of subject matter. Because the, the basic ideas that we're going to go through translate, obviously, to, to whatever sort of shot that you're working on, pretty much. So I think that most of you have actually um, got some uh, rotoscoping experience under your belt. But for those of you that haven't, you know, what, what we're basically going to be doing here is building up a, uh, a set of mats um, to, to, to sort of cut out these, these objects. Um, what we'll also be doing um, a bit later on is we'll be taking a look at a new feature in Mocha Pro 3, which is to, to have a look at the camera solve uh, and do a 3D camera solve on, uh, on this footage as well and see how we can, we can start to use that to, to speed up our workflow as well. Um, but let's, uh, let's look at the, uh, the absolute wrong way of, uh, of trying to cut out this, uh, this milk carton, for example. So, I'm going to come up to my toolbar up here and just take the, the X-spline tool uh, and just draw a very, very quick mask around the entire object. Uh, and I'm going to come in, I'm going to go around the uh, spout here, I'm going to go up, down, along, use my right click just to close that shape off. Let's just uh, make that a little bit bigger so we can see that uh, a bit better now. Um, so we now have our very, very quick mask here that's sort of just, yeah, it's going to pretty much basically cut out what we're doing on this single frame. But as our, obviously as our shot starts to move off a little bit, um, we can't really see what's going on anymore. So let's try and animate this, this mask out. Just really quickly, I'm going to use the, um, the transform tool here just to uh, come in and reshape everything up. So just going to scale that up and um, move this over and just into a general right place there. Scale it over again a bit more. Running at a slightly lower resolution for the for the webinar, so things are a little bit sensitive on the old uh, Wacom tablet here. But you can just see that, you know, as I get around here, we're going to have to start to play around and I can't quite match that shape in. And the, the simple camera movement where it's a, a, a crane coming down, you know, we're not really getting a shape that's, that's anywhere usable. I can keep sort of playing around with this until, um, until the cows come home. We're not going to do it this way. So my general rule of thumb is to try and track um, whatever you can. If you can track an object, fantastic. Uh, if you can, can't track the object perfectly, but you can track out the, uh, um, the camera move, that's good as well. That's going to take you uh, someplace as well. Um, so tracking is going to be absolutely essential for, uh, for my sort of rotoscoping. The other thing that is also essential is breaking up these complex objects into into smaller shapes you know so we're going to start to to take a look at these um uh at the milk carton and the teapot as sort of smaller discrete shapes as well um and find out how we can we can start to uh use the, the tracking data to really get a handle on that as well so one of the things that um is is, is fun about mocha pro uh, is that it does have a, a, a built-in tracker. You know, it's, it's actually renowned for its, uh, for its tracker. Um, but it's not a point tracker, and this is something that does throw uh, people off. Um, it is a planar tracker instead. So instead of tracking just individual points, if I was to create another shape up here, as I, as I just did before, um, instead of just taking you know, a series of points inside this object here, what Mocha is going to do is it can track um, basically that texture that's going on inside there. So um, this, this means that it really helps to, to sort of cut through things like noise and 
and motion blur, uh, which makes it perfect for for a sort of um, yeah a rotoscoping aid, basically. So when I'm talking about planes, what I'm really talking about is just a uh, a geometric plane. So a, a sort of side the side of this um, a milk carton here is a single plane here. Uh, another plane would be the opposite side of the milk carton, or the uh, this this side here. What wouldn't quite be a plane is this this teapot. The teapot here is is round, which which means and a, and a plane is is flat. It's a you know an infinitely thin two um, D two D shape. But what we'll have a look at later on in the webinar is actually how we can um, get a good track out of this non-planar object. Cool. Well, let's um, let's let's actually get to it. We've got uh, a lot to do in a, in a very short time, and I'm I'm gabbing on. So um, I'm going to come back up to the Xpline tool up on my toolbar, and the first thing I'm going to do, actually, before I do any of that, is just ditch that shape, is just take a part. The footage, so I'm going to play it, play it back a few times, and we're going to just sort of uh, quickly analyze it out. Um, and I'm going to look at my uh, milk carton here to begin with. So what I want to do is I want to get this first side out. So I'm going to break this down into a number of smaller shapes. I'm going to break it down into a, a front shape, a side shape as well, and I'm going to then take out the top. On the side here and the top on the right side as well. So we're going to make four basic shapes to take out this uh, to take out this milk carton. And on the teapot, um, I'm going to break this down as well. Uh, let's take a look at how this moves. So what I'm looking for when I'm doing uh, rotoscoping is maintaining edge consistency. So it really doesn't. I'm going to say it really doesn't matter how you get the shape. It actually does matter how you get the shape. Um, it doesn't matter so much, in particular, which shapes you pick up, so long as your overall shape uh, actually fits. So we're going to make a series of smaller, smaller spline objects here to build up the main shape. But let's look at the milk carton first. Now keep keep typing your questions in, um, and we will get to those at the the end of the webinar as well. So the first thing I'm going to do is track the uh, the side of this milk carton here. So let's undo that, or just get rid of that. What I'm looking for when I'm when I'm doing a uh, a planar track is I'm looking to to see what sort of object or what sort of shape I can draw, which is going to be completely unimpeded by any other objects crossing over it because those are going to cause us trouble. Um, and if we come to the last frame, what we've got is we've got our front face here just being taken over by the, uh, the spout on our teapot. So if I do make a shape that goes around my uh, front face here, I'm going to make sure that it doesn't hit the spout of the teapot. So I can do that. Actually, I'll probably just bring those in there. I'm going to turn off the transform tool just while I'm drawing the original shape. I'll come over to my layer controls. I will call this one front track. And we can now color code things up so we can see these splines even better. Let's make that one yellow. Lovely. Cool. So Let's bring up our track over there. What I was doing is um, I used uh, Command-1 to just come into my main working wor um, workspace. Obviously, because I'm working at a lower resolution for this webinar, um, we've got a number of different workspaces all set up. Each of them are doing slightly different things. So uh, I'm going to try not to switch between them too often because I'm not sure how the, uh, the webcasting uh, software really likes that, so um, here we go. So I've got my main mat, and we can have a look at it by turning my mat on up here, in the uh, just below the uh, the main toolbar. And if we come down to our track now, we've got the uh, the properties that we're going to be 
uh, playing with to, to get this track looking good. So we've got the input channel, which is offset to luminance, which is good. The minimum percentage of pixels used, which is probably the most uh, important of our, uh, of our tracking controls that we've got here. What this basically means is that um, how many of the pixels uh, in this shape does Mocha have to match from one frame to the next before it can be happy that it's got a good match and then move on. The, the default that it puts here um, is actually really, it's quite, it's quite intelligent based on the resolution of the, uh, the frame that you're working on and the size of your object. So at the moment it's, it's set to 30% because we've got quite a big um, shape going on in our HD frame. Uh, but if we're working on a much smaller area in a, in a smaller, um, maybe a 720p or an SD frame, you know, that minimum percentage of pixels used may be up to 90% just by default. Generally, I leave that at the default setting to begin with, and we'll see how we get on. Now, the type of motion here really is, is all about what sort of motion that we're tracking. Uh, the translation is the position, uh, X and Y position, I mean. Uh, then we can also track in scale and rotation. Shear uh, is, will basically start to bring in the deform uh, of this shape. So the, the shape will start to sort of shear and distort um, depending on the, the angle of the change, uh, which is very, very good, very useful for when uh, natural objects are moving. Uh, and we'll see that working in practice. And perspective is a bit like shear in that it also detract, uh, uh, tracks distortion, but it, what it does is it also um, constrains that distortion to sort of items moving in perspective. So that's absolutely perfect for um, flat stationary objects uh, like car number plates, um, uh, you know, screen replacements, or even this uh, side of the milk carton. So I'm gonna leave perspective turned on. Uh, large motion, we're moving quite large, uh, you know, between our frames, so we're going to leave that there. Small motion is, is really just to take out sort of smaller camera judder, or if we've got a, a generally static frame. Uh, and everything else I'm going to leave at default as it is, and we're going to hit track back. Cool. Um, right, let's, uh, let's pop back into our other workspace here, and let's take a little look at this. So behind all of that, everything was tracking in quite nicely. We have a look at this shape. Um, it actually is you know, fitting in really quite nicely indeed. So um, one of the big things with Mocha, and this is, this is actually one of the things that's, that's quite tricky to, to get your head around to begin with, is that what we're seeing on this shape here actually has, um, it ha well, it has, some relationship, obviously, but it isn't a one-to-one -one direct relationship with the actual tracking data that's going on underneath it. So to see that, what we've got is uh, our surface. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up to my um, spline visibility and turn off the spline visibility and turn off my mats, but turn on my surface, which is the blue button with a little S on it for surface. And this gives me a four-point shape that actually just properly does describe um, the surface that's been tracked in. And I can uh, move this up and around over here to the corners of my, well, the general corners of my, uh, my carton here. And what this will give me, if I play this through, is this will give me a much better idea whether my track is, is right. So if I turn on the grid up here, Next to the uh, next to the surface, we can see if our track is uh, is good. So if I'm seeing any sort of big distortion or um, or sort of uh, some jittery stuff going on there, then I know that the um, the track is no good whatsoever. So I'll have to go in and and retrack and or change the object up a little bit. But that that looks good. That looks good for now. So uh, let's let's turn my surface off. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to use the uh, the new layer controls 
uh, structuring stuff and start to take my track into a new folder on its own and I'm going to call this layer group tracks and this is just going to be hidden away now so we can't see this so uh, let's turn my overlays back on my splines are back on again here but I can turn off the processing cog which means it's not going to track it anymore and also turn off the visibility on that as well and now we've got that perfect track going on what I can do is I can start to come in and I've done the same thing again I started to zoom whilst uh, we got the zoom in a little bit here yeah I can start to come into my explain uh, tool again and draw up uh, something of a, a better shape now I'm just going to come down and go all the way through let's just add a little bit at the bottom there just going to do this very quickly um, yeah so I'm going to go all the way through past the the spout here because I don't really I don't really care about the uh, the teapot spout coming into my um, my main shape here because I'm going to do a whole new object uh, for this teapot which we can um, either cut out or do whatever we need to do uh, at a later date um, I am going to add in another point here because our this is the great thing about the milk carton is that actually it's not completely straight at all um, it does have a lot of uh, bends and curves and a bit of a uh, it's been distressed a little bit let's uh, let's put it like that we can use my right click and then just drag on the um, on the waiting point up here just to sharpen all the corners up and let's give this one a nice let's make this a nice cyan outline here and yeah the white goes okay there cool so I actually don't want to do any animation on this if at all possible because the uh, the more that I have to start to sort of hand animate any of these shapes uh, the more likelihood that there's going to be some sort of human error creeping in uh, I'm, I'm gonna get something you know a, a pixel out or I'm going to add in some motion that that it didn't need to you know didn't need to be in there anymore um, so the the less human interaction we can get in our shapes the better um, not only is it going to be faster to get the work done but you're also going to get a much more consistent shape uh, because one of the things you want to avoid when you're doing any sort of rotoscoping work or any sort of mat creation um, is to get sort of shapes that are bubbling and boiling uh, on the edges because that's that's a dead giveaway that um, that things aren't quite aren't quite as they seem, um, and it's 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 quite fun, you know. The the smaller the um, uh, the errors are, uh, it's the more annoying they are to to watch, um, and it, it happens all the time, you know. If you if you're on a again a very tight deadline, um, there's there's can just be sort of small errors creeping in. Uh, which which will have to be have to be fixed, but you know it's it's always those small ones where the uh, uh, just an edge is just moving in a very slightly unnatural sort of way that causes the most grief. Uh, my my rule of thumb is um, if you're going to make something wrong, make it consistently wrong, um, and then you know people don't notice it. Uh, so let's let's call this one um, we'll call this one front. And we'll call this one M4 mask. And this has got my uh, tracking cog up here as well. Um, but let's actually come to my layer properties. And I'm just going to bring this out because, yeah, real estate is a uh, is actually a uh, an issue here. Uh, and what I can do is I can link this front mask now to my track layer, my TR layer. And if I zoom out on this and play this back that's going to take the uh, the planar track that we've just done let's turn my overlays off so we can see if that's consistent or not yeah it's going to take the tracking data that I've, I've got there and and basically just move that one shape in the right way that's going to fit that in there for me and that's looking uh, actually pretty good um, I don't think there's too many changes I need to make here. 
Uh, if I come take my mats off, turn my overlays back on, what we can do, I can see my edge here is slipped, just a, a, a wee tad. What I can do is if I turn my transform back on, is I can either you know scale this up just by grabbing on one of the corners. Uh, I can rotate it around if I'm just slightly further into the corner, rotate the whole thing around. Or what I can do also, if I hold down the command key on Mac or control key on Windows, is I can do a distort. And let's zoom out and just see exactly what that's doing. I'm holding the Z key down to move into my zoom window and holding the X key down to move to the pan tool. Yeah, so if I hold down the, uh, the command or control key, I can distort this up. So what this is doing is it's building on top of the tracking data uh, and actually distorting the entire shape up. And I am much more comfortable um, just distorting and keyframing shapes rather than coming in and doing you know single control points, if at all possible. Because every time you move just one control point, uh, that's going to have another knock-on effect and, and possibly leave your, your mask looking uh, inconsistent. So if we can transform the entire data, or the entire shape up, um, that keeps that consistent edge going all the way through again. Um, so I'll hold down the command key over here as well, and we'll just, we'll just bump that over there. Cool. And let's play that back. And this is set a keyframe on top of my tracking data. So my tracking data is still there in the background. We're still linked to my, my front track. We're just doing the little tweaks coming on here. Another little cool thing to do, actually, when um, tweaking all of this up, is if I hit Stabilize on there, hit Play, it's going to stabilize out um, the, the track data or the object that's in the, in the track data here. So it's much, much easier to see any sort of small inconsistencies when the, the object itself is, uh, is static in the frame. I'll turn that off just for the time being. And we'll get, um, we'll get quickly onto our, our second, second side. So I'll just double click on the layer properties and that'll, that brings it back or docks it back where it, it once was. Cool, now let's uh, lock up my front mat there and we'll put it in its own layer group and we will call this one Milk. Very creative with my names there. Um, I'm going to do a little bit more tracking, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, so I do want to track in the, this side here. Now, it's not as easy as, uh, as it looks, um, simply because we've got a little light reflection coming down here the, with, um, with point trackers, any sort of light uh, change going in or something moving over, that has the ability to just completely throw off our, um, completely throw off our track. So uh, what I'm going to do is just show you how we can get around that. Again, keep, uh, keep uh, your questions coming in the, uh, the question box and I will get to them. So we'll, uh, we'll pop in. Uh, I'm just going to turn off visibility on my milk carton there for a second. And what I'm going to do is I am going to track in this top area here. And it's going to include the, the little light sweeping down here. But this whole area down here is actually you know, coplanar. This is all sitting on the same, the same object or the same, the same plane. Um, the only difference between the side here and the, the front here is that we've got a dirty great big uh, teapot uh, sat in its way. Um, so what I can do is actually add in another, uh, using uh, the X-spline plus there, add another X-spline to this layer here. So I'm going to take in a little bit of this text here. And it's important because there's, there's actually quite a lot of texture in there. And this gives me a, a good amount of, uh, of depth um, or, uh, you know, a good, a good size of, uh, of this shape of this plane, uh, which is really going to help out because if we're just tracking in a tiny wee little um, area up the top here, um, any small um, 
problems or small inconsistencies are going to get magnified when we try and take that tracking data and apply it to this entire side here. So if we can come in with a fairly decent size up here and a little bitty size up here, which is also going to be very useful, that's really going to help us out. I'm going to color code this one in yellow again because it's also a track. And I will call this one, we'll call this one side track. Now let's, uh, let's see if I can avoid some of, some of the problems that we had last time. Actually, before we do any of that, I do need to go through the little uh, checklist here. We'll keep luminance. See, 90% of pixels used. That's quite high. Um, and it's based off the initial shape up here. It's not based off me adding in any other area. So I'm going to take that down a little bit. Also, I need to take that down because we've got that light moving down and through. So um, that can probably, if that takes up you know, more than than 10% of the pixels overall, uh, that 90% of uh, pixels used isn't going to be consistent. So we'll take that down a little bit. It's one of those, those fun little things is that, you know, you can sometimes get a more consistent track by using less of the data or being interested in less of the data. I'm going to turn perspective back on again here because it is in perspective. It is a flat, um, a flat side here. Um, and, just giving that perspective is hopefully going to minimize some of the, uh, the, the possible errors it's going to, it's going to get uh, when we start to dis, uh, distort out a little bit. Cool, let's move me back to my other workspace using the Command 2 button. And let's track this out and hopefully we won't have the same sort of freak out that we had before. So I'm going to track this forwards on the bottom button down there. Little bit of a freak out. Just a tiny little bit of a freak out. Hopefully you can see actually the um, the shape is moving quite nicely and consistently despite all of that. Uh, he says actually, unfortunately, I'm going to stop my track there and let's take a look at something that's not moving nicely or consistently and it is down here. So where my edge here is happening, let's see what happens as the teapot encroaches in. Well, actually my shape is changing and changing shape based on the encroachment of that teapot. So that's, that's not good. That's not good. So most of this, this data here isn't great. So I'm going to just change that up a little bit, make that a little bit smaller. We've still got some of the data coming in here. I'm just going to retrack that. And that gives us hopefully a slightly better track. As we move through, we can see that the teapot now isn't coming in, encroaching in on the... Um, uh, on the, the shape that we've got here. So the data that we're getting out of this is actually a whole load better. Boom. There's an article of faith that everything was working up there, up the top, and that seems to, seems to be generally okay. But as I said before, when we're just looking at the shapes here, we actually don't know. I've absolutely no idea if this is a decent track or not. I can tell as soon as I stick on my surface, let's reposition this surface over here. Now the surface itself, um, we can come in and basically move this around at any point and we're not going to add a keyframe on this, on this surface at all. Uh, this surface will actually just stay that weird shape that I made it. Um, because this is just representing the uh, the tracking data that we've that we've generated up. So let's put that down there at the bottom here, and see what we've got. So I'll play that backwards, and hopefully we're fairly consistent. And actually, that's looking uh, that's looking quite nice. 
that's also looking a lot nicer than we had it in rehearsal. So I'm happy about that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to, to figure out what this secret area at the bottom actually is, because we can't see this bottom corner at all. We can only sort of um, just try and gauge what it's going to be from the rest of the, uh, from the rest of the objects. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and line up this surface, oh sorry, this line and this line here, and just bring that over there, turn on my grid, play it back, see if that's, see if that's looking okay. It's not great. I mean, it's, it's, it's good, but it's not perfect. Because if we have a little look down here, let's check out what happens as this pops in. We can start to see that it slips a little bit. It slipped a little bit up. Now, I really want to try and get the, um, the best uh, tracking data that I possibly can get uh, before I start connecting any shapes to it, uh, because you know, basically, if we um, if we connect a uh, a lovely, nice, consistent shake uh, to some weird, shaky tracking data, it's going to give us a ton more uh, manual uh, keyframes that we're going to have to set afterwards, uh, and I don't have the time for that. So uh, it's far better to actually spend um, another ten minutes on a on a track. Uh, to get a track working properly uh, than it is to just sort of uh, go in and sort of, you know, fly by the, by the seat of your pants. You could spend, you know, another hour or two just trying to, um, for some, some complex, uh, complex objects, just trying to fight against your track here. Uh, really not a good idea, that. But what we can do to help us out, if I pop into my other workspace again, uh, and I'm just going to hit the asterisk on the number pad just to, frame that back again. What I can do is I can use my little adjust track here. Um, so if I come into my adjust track, I, I need to know that I'm at a good frame, which I am here, and come into my adjust track, I automatically have a keyframe added here. Because what we're doing with this adjust track is we're just in the, in the same way that when we um, uh, roto the, the side of the, the milk front here, um, in the same way that we were building keyframes on top of our um, front track uh, layer here, what the adjust track is doing is it's actually going in and adding keyframes on tra on top of the, the tracking data that we've we've got. So this is really suitable for for times where we um, just can't get uh, you know a hundred percent tracking data, but the changes that we've got are sort of fairly um, fairly smooth and fairly linear over time because we will be adding linear keyframes. Um, that's what we've, we've got down here. Um, what it's not really suitable for is just a general all-purpose um, uh, fixed bad tracking data. Uh, I, most of the time, if I can't fix something in the adjust track with just a, a, a few keyframes uh, and do it really quickly, um, I'm still getting really bad results. What I'll do is I'll just chuck out the the tracking layer that I've already got and just retrack. Because you know it's you you really you're you're sort of going to be wasting your time again trying to fight um, fight the track. Can't fight the system, man. So well, let's zoom in and let's have a little look here. So I'm going to start with my um, top left hand. Oh, sorry, top right hand corner. And check out my little master frame, my little uh, zoom window. Let's zoom this bad boy up a little bit more. And we do not want to zoom today. Fair enough. Uh, let's reposition it over. I'll oh, keep it over there. Cool. So let's uh, let's take a look at the master frame here. Uh, we've got it up over into the corner here. And if everything's great, then I fully expect that that point is going to remain consistent as I scrub through the timeline here. What I can see is that after frame 12, we start to drift off a little bit. That's not good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a, uh, another keyframe here. I can either do that over in my 
add keyframe down there. Or I can hit auto to automatically try and find the exact same point as we had before. Uh, and that works quite, quite well. Let's just take that down. We can tap that down using the down buttons there. And what I'm going to do now is just scrub this along and find out where it gets wrong. So we can already see just by this one here, we're staying fairly consistent up until around about here where we're drifted, we've drifted again. So I'm going to add another keyframe at uh, frame 72. And what I'm looking for here is the point of absolute maximum drift. If I've got that wrong, you could find the image sort of um, either popping in or popping out again or sort of drifting in and drifting out. Definitely not good. So that's, um, that's the top right. The uh, bottom right here, that's going to be a bit trickier. Because as we know, we actually can't see what's going on in the bottom right hand corner because we've got our dirty great big teapot in front of us. So this is where the uh, educated guesswork comes in. I'm going to try and find a happy balance here uh, between being able to actually see the corners or the other uh, sides here of our, of our surface and being able to see the point well enough. Um, it's going to be a challenge, but we'll be all right. So again, I'm going to look to see where the drift is. I'm, let's use the, um, the top right-hand corner here as our sort of guide frame um, and just add a keyframe there because we, we know that that's, that track up to that point is going to be okay. Or at least we hope so anyway. And let's just move that through. And I can see now, actually from frame, it's about frame 20, that's still looking good. So I'll add another keyframe there, actually. Go back and remove the keyframe from 11 because we don't need it. And let's look to see when this point drops down or doesn't drop down far enough, I should say. And we're looking for the point of absolute maximum drift, which is actually on the, uh, the last frame, which is good because that means or that indicates that we've probably got a good um, a linear move that we, we have to do here to change it. Uh, we can't actually see to do anything with the auto. I say that, it's pretty, actually kind of nice in the, uh, nicely in the side there, but no, we have to come down and actually do this manually. Bring that down, we'll have a little look. And we can see that st we've still got trouble, but it's, it's shown us actually we've got another point around about here where we've got the absolute drift so that's where the movement's the wrong now so let's come in and just bring this down here so i said i would be very surprised if we only had one problem and just so i expected as i mentioned before if we haven't got it in the right place we drift up and out. You can see that drifting out before we drift back to the correct one. So that point of absolute drift there, boom, that point there, that's going to be our keyframe. Not this one um, at frame, what was it, 65. Actually, this one here. So let's come in and we'll bring this down. Nice. Let's go back to our previous keyframe. We'll delete it. The fewer keyframes we can have on here, the better. Keeps a much more consistent shape. And that is working out nicely. Might need to bring that over there a little bit, but that's fine. Cool, so I'm happy with, uh, with the shape that I've got there. I think let's take a, let's just bring this out and let's come over and zoom out a little bit here. And check that out. Cool. So we we are actually able to now um, attach our other side to that there. And in the time honoured uh, tradition of uh, of cookery shows, here's one that I made earlier. 
It's exactly the same as we had before. We've got our two tracks, our front and our side track, and our side milks there. Well, the only thing that's different here is that I have now put on the other side here. Cool, well, let's, uh, let's go through again. Right, so we've now got our two sides. Our milk carton is looking good. I'm happy with that. Let's take a look at our teapot. This teapot is a funny beast. Let's uh, turn off my mats there for a second. Um, yeah, because as we said at the beginning of the webinar, keep asking your questions. Um, I should say that right now. Um, yeah, as we said at the uh, beginning of the webinar, this surface here isn't completely planar um, because we've got an, a nice sort of curved surface going over here. So if we were to uh, track this in here, um, it, it wouldn't quite give us the the exact um, the, the exact same movement as the um, as the object is is giving, or as the camera movement is giving the object, I should say. Because in this in this shot, it's the camera moving, not the object, of course. But let's um, let's take a look at this. We can actually still get a decent look at this, or a decent um, a decent shape out of this. I track in quite a bit, make quite a big shape here, and um, I'm going to use this this track here to drive pretty much the rest of the shapes that I'm going to draw up here. Um, and because of that. I probably don't want to have shear turned on um, because I'm much more interested now in just taking out the uh, the camera movement than I am in uh, taking out all the distortion that is, you know, going to be um, only relevant to this area of the uh, of the teapot. So if I turn off shear. I'll get a, tra a good translation scale and rotation um, track. So. Uh, Cover your eyes and prepare for the uh, prepare for the worst. But we're going to track this forwards, and that's working nicely. Fantastic. <laughs> there we go. I'm not sure why that's uh, that's not giving as many headaches, but uh, I'm very glad. I've got to say, very glad. Cool. So that's going to track forwards uh, quite quickly. Um, we are working at um, a, a 1080p. Uh, resolution for this um, uh, for this image, and it is uh, chewing through it quite quite nicely. Uh, and if I had slightly uh, more processors in my machine, it would also chomp through it even faster. But you can never you can never have enough processing power. I think. Cool. So we've got our lovely little uh, uh, track going on in there. Uh, and of course, let's let's do what we always do. Let's come in, turn our surface on. Uh, let's turn our splines off again on the button next to the overlays. And here it's going to be quite tricky to see exactly what's happening, but we're just going to look at this uh, or, or look at this back just to check the the uh, consistency of the track. We know there's a problem if the grid starts to jump up and down a little bit. Um, just jitter up. I should also obviously remind you that uh, the frame rate um, that you're seeing on your end might not be uh, real time. Um, so you might not be pushing the, uh, the 25 frames a second that I'm seeing over here. But it should be good enough to give you the idea that that track is golden. That was lovely, that one. Um, and this is this has given me enough. If I hit stabilize, turn all the other stuff off, and we hit play through on that, that's really give me a nice stable um, teapot to work on. So let's get our teapot done. Right, let's call this one. Uh, we'll call this one teapot. Let's find where my P key is, there we go, teapot track, and we'll drag that into the tracks and forget about it for now. So we're going to break this teapot up into a number of different shapes, and now I'm done with the track over here, I'm going to switch back to my other workspace 
so we've got a lot more space uh, dedicated for um, our other roto tools. Uh, let's come in and we're going to break this this teapot down. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is is take a look and actually just see. I've done it again. I was too busy, not or too busy talking and not thinking. Uh, yeah. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, I'm going to come in and watch this back. So I'm going to make this one for the main body, so the round area of the teapot. I'm going to do another one where the lid actually starts to pop up or the rim for the lid starts to pop up here. So you can see I can take this out. This area here is one circle and that's going to come and be a really nice simple shape. So I love working with simple shapes. So this is going to be a nice round circle here. But this rim up here, I'm going to take this out as a shape um, on its own. Uh, so, because the movement of this rim here is different to the movement of the teapot itself, obviously. So as the camera uh, takes this into perspective, this rim is looking very different than it did when we were looking at it from the top. Whereas the main body of the, uh, the teapot, which is just round, is still staying kind of round. Uh, I'm going to do one for the spout, and I'm going to do one um one big one for the handle as well so let's uh let's take a quick look and do the uh do the main body first so i'll come in and keep things nice and easy uh, i'm gonna just bring that over there round that out a little bit probably added a few too many keyframes or uh, control points around here so we'll just take out some of those and see if we actually need any of them cool so that's uh, looking odd for sure um, so let's round all those off um, yeah let's come in and bring in my um, uh, transform tool yet again and use that to just distort or scale in to begin with and scale in that shape So bring that around and around. And what I'm trying to do is envisage in my mind's eye the back of this without uh, thinking about the rim down there. So let's turn off the transform tool there for a second. We'll just zoom in, holding down Z, and we'll just pan around, holding down X. And we'll just take that around and abouts there. So just round that off using the, um, the weight on the X line there, just to round that out a little bit. Cool, and that's given me a uh, shape that I can live with. And we'll turn this one yellow. Or blue, no yellow, there we go, I like yellow. So that our mats are slightly different colors than the, the mat is in here. So if I turn all my mats on and turn the visibility on on the milk, you can see my milk is white and my teapot's yellow. Turn the visibility off on my milk group layer. And we will call this one, so I want to keep writing in teapots, I can just call this one pot body. And make a new layer group, call this one teapot. Cool, so let's uh, now come in, bring my layer properties up one more time. Oh, didn't want to do that. I want to put that down there. And we will then link this one to our main teapot track. I'm not sidetrack, teapot track. There we go. And let's take a little look how that works out. That's not perfect, but what it has done is it stabilized out most of the camera camera work. So if I turn the stabilize off over here and then turn it back on again, you can see everything's a whole load more stable than it was before. So I'm gonna to come to the final uh, final frame here. Let's just double click that, to, oh, I locked that back in the wrong place. Move over onto my other monitor. 
So I've come into my transform tool again here. And we'll just shift this out. I can use my curse keys as well, so the arrow keys just to move this around and hold down shift to move it a lot further or move it 10 pixels at a time. And that just slots that into place. And that now, actually just with that one keyframe, now fits into place absolutely perfectly. Pretty cool. And I'm going to do the same thing for the rest of them. In a here's one I made earlier kind of way. And let's zoom back out onto that. So actually, here's one I've made exactly the same. Fantastic. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, cool. Well, actually, that. oh, no, there we go. No, I actually have added some other stuff to it. So I have added the, uh, let's take a look at all my masks there, all my mats, sorry. So I have added in the, um, uh, the lid rim here and just another little small shape going on just for the, uh, uh, for the, what's it called? It's not going to be a handle. What's it going to be called? The little uh, bit at the top there, whatever that's called. So you can tell I'm not an expert in teapots, despite drinking my body weight in tea every day. Of course, you can see how we, you know, we can break up those simple shapes or we bring up, break up this complex shape into a series of simple shapes, match those to our simple track, which we've got down here, a little teapot track. So match those in and just with the minimum number of keyframes, literally, I think it was one keyframe each, uh, slot those into place. Cool. Keep your questions coming because uh, we are going to be looking at uh, something else a little bit here. We're going to look at um, one of the new uh, features in V3. Uh, which is the 3D camera solver. So what this uh, actually does is it takes the tracking data that we picked up from uh, our other uh, shapes, our other tracks, and it uses those to to calculate out a 3D camera solve to 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 basically calculate out the uh, movement that we've got here um, going on with our camera. And the advantage this has for for Roto is that it means that you know just by um, taking in a few sort of simple shapes if we can build up a camera out of those uh, we can come in and we can um, you know use that one master uh, a bit of tracking data to slot in a whole series of other small shapes and know that they're gonna um, uh, be there stay there so uh, to do that let's turn off the mats again for a second to do that, I'm just gonna I'm gonna add another couple of uh, of layers and we'll track those in. So I'm gonna take something which is gonna help to describe the uh, the movement of the camera. So the different planes of the camera. So we've got one for our um, uh, the front of our milk here, which is good because that's at one distance of the camera. I'll do one for the wall over here which is another distance of the camera. Uh, I'll do one for the floor as well, uh, if I can find a good place for the floor. The floor's actually very tricky. Um, I say it's a floor, it's actually just the, 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 the surface that we've got here, the top uh, tabletop surface. This is actually really tricky because uh, it's all shiny. So it's all just reflections of lights popping in. So it's, it's going to be quite tricky to get fantastic stick tracking data out of that um, normally we'll see we'll see how we get on so we'll call this one um, I'll call this one ground even though it's not it's the ground plane and we'll call this one wall track cool so let's uh, just track those backwards um, I'm going to come back into my other workspace and on the uh, both of these I can select multiple um, multiple layers and turn perspective on, on both of these ones here. And you can see where we've got um, these hashed out, these little values hashed out. It basically means that um, we've got multiple layers selected and they've got different values going in on both of those layers. But that's cool. Uh, so 
let's uh, yeah, let's we've got the uh, processing node turned on on both of these. So let's shift this over a little bit, see if that helped last time, and we can. Uh, we're back. Um, let's see if we can cancel that. I wonder what I did differently last time. Yeah, so we can. What we can do is basically be processing out uh, multiple uh, shapes simultaneously. Uh, so this is, you know, really useful for uh, if we've got a whole load of things that we're wanting to uh, wanting to track in. Let's let's try that. Let's try moving it really extreme. There we go. So we'll take a look at the. Uh, I'm I'm a little bit worried about how the uh, the floor is tracking in here, but um, as a proof of concept, it's going to be great. Another thing I'm going to do is stop the tracking right now. Is I'm also a little bit worried about our um, wall here being obscured by the uh, the, uh, the milk carton down there, uh, and this is actually very very cool um, because layer order over here really makes a difference. If I have a layer over the top of another one, so I've got my milk now over the top of the uh, of the wall layer over here, what that's going to do is it's going to act as a track mat, so it's going to cut out this area down here. So uh, if I come in here and go to mats, selected track mats, let's turn that on. And let's take a look what happens if I turn this one a lovely blue. There we go. See what happens as the milk carton now goes in front of our wall. We'll turn the um, transform tool off. We'll turn the splines off. And we'll just look at the shape here. What you should be able to see is the, uh, the milk layer here, the milk carton layer, is actually cutting out the uh, wall mat here. Stop this. As it, oh, we'll leave this and it's almost at the end now. Um, so it doesn't actually factor in um, that area, which is the little carton, into the, uh, into the calculation, into the track, which is very, very nice. So you can see that where these are overlapping, because the milk carton's over the top of our wall, it's not factoring that into the, uh, into the uh, calculation. So by building up different layers in this way, we can get some really complex tracks going on um, uh, without you know, compromising our data. Cool, so we've got um, our wall and our uh, ground sorted out there. Let's uh, take a look at the surface. I'll be very interested to see what this is doing. I'm going to try and align my surface with areas that I can, that I can identify. And let's turn the uh, the overlays, the splines off there, and we'll just uh, we'll just play that one backwards, and we'll see how that's working out. And if this works, I'll be uh, I'll be very happy. And actually, it's done a good job of hanging in there. So you see, we've we've really not got uh, a lot of judder or anything, even though the uh, the lights are changing up. Cool. Happy with that, which means that we can now go in to our camera solve over here. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually I'm going to take out my layer properties over onto the other side again, so that I can have my other tracks turned on. And what I can do here is I can choose to uh, select multiple uh, layers that we're going to include in our in our camera solve. So we'll take the front there as well. Let's turn turn that on. Cool. Uh, and with the camera solve, we've got you know a number of different little cameras that we can we can work on. We can do well. We can let Mocha try and figure it out. Um, this is the the sort of the auto is is something that I would uh, shy away from because uh, it takes longer to process. We've got a pan tilt zoom. If you're just dealing with um, a camera on a, a tripod head that's only doing pan tilt. And zoom. 
or we've got the uh, the parallax change where we've got a proper moving camera. So it could be a handheld camera or, you know, like this shot where something's on a crane. Uh, and the, the small parallax change is for, for shots where, you know, there's not a lot of, um, uh, of parallax between, not a lot of, of change in motion between the, the different layers. It tries to figure those out. But here we've got a nice large parallax chain going, uh, change going on. And we, we'll set the focal length. 35 to 70, that's the, the sort of normal sort of area. And I'll hit solve. I'll have my layer selected and I'll hit solve. And that will go along and it will um, process all of that stuff up. And here's one I made earlier. <laughs> Let's uh, come in and I'm just going to, while it's doing that, I'm just going to open up uh, the camera data that I have because what it's going to generate out is this. A lovely little text file when we hit export out camera data, which is already processed out anyway, so that's, that's fine. <laughs> cool. It was faster than I was. So I can export out the camera data. I can take it out either as After Effects or for FBX, for, for Nuke, or for um, uh, Maya. We'll take that out as uh, After Effects data, copy that to the clipboard, pop into After Effects, and if we have the uh, the Mocha camera plugin, we get this little one down here. So I hit my paste Mocha camera. It's not giving me any data because my camera self quality is zero. Um, yeah, obviously something's not quite quite right there. So we'll just come in with the uh, I'll copy the the camera self I've got over here and just delete that. And we'll do the same thing. Paste that in. And what that will do is it will paste in our, uh, or it'll bring in a, uh, a little camera, plus some lovely null objects so we know where in the world we were tracking. So as we scrub through that, all of those null objects should, if everything's uh, perfect, should stay exactly in place. So that means when we come in, I'll just do a bit of text here. Text, because we're running out of uh, time, so let's... Uh, get this looking done. We'll find, uh, find one of these back nulls over here, which is going to be, and these, these nulls are actually the, uh, the, the surface, describe the surface of our, um, of our shape that we had before. So I've got null 13. Let's uh, cut that with uh, command X or control X and paste that in, command V, control V. We will shy guy these other ones out of the way. And I'm going to turn my text into 3D. I'm going to hit U to open up all of the data that we've got over here in our, in our null object. And I'm going to paste that. Let's uh, try that again. So copy all of these with Apple C and then paste those back in. And now this, let's scale that as we scale this up, and we'll rotate this back around. We and we'll flip this around 180 in orientation. Let's hit R to bring orientation up. Boom. Uh, and I can reposition this quite happily in the um, in the X and Y without really changing the other stuff that's going on. And let's just ram preview that out. And that should fit in very nicely indeed. Cool. So that means that our camera's working. So we could easily um, get, you know, our back wall done as, as one uh, big shape. And when it comes to getting out the, uh, the mats, what I can do here, if I just uh, take all these out and just sort of hide these a little bit let's put those back into tracks what i can do is i can come in back into my track here export out the shape data as after effect shape data please all my visible layers and copy those to the clipboard pop back into after effects i'm going to make a copy i'll just duplicate that main one up there put that over the top 
and I can paste my mocha mask. Let's come to the first frame. Paste my mocha mask in there. And let's see what I've got. Cool. That is my mocha mask we have in here. So if I'd done all of the other things, that will cut out nicely. And I say, if we've done all the other things, here's one I made earlier. Let's uh, save that out. Take a quick little look at, um, at the entire mask uh, set that we've got going over here. Export these out. Let's just take any one of these. Export out my shape data here. All visible layers. Copy that to the clipboard. Back into After Effects. Let's delete all of the masks that we've got in here. Paste my mocha mask back in. And we've got all the masks labeled. Oops. Come to the first frame, Benjamin. There we go. And paste my mocha mask back in again there. We've got all the frames labeled out there exactly as we had them in Mocha. And that is now tracking in quite nicely. Cool, that's it for uh, for me for now. But um, but hang around, I'll still be here to answer some questions. So keep them coming, keep them coming, keep them coming. <laughs> um, can tracking data be brought into Flame? Yes, yes it can. Yeah, you've got, um, actually we've got tons of uh, different exports that you can do, but you've got, um, yeah, two different types of, uh, of tracking data you can take out. You can either take out the point tracker data or the, uh, the stabilizer data there. So you can use it in different sorts of ways. Um, you've also got, I, I noticed some guys were using Fusion as well. Um, so you can also take out uh, Fusion uh, data as well as, uh, as well as Nuke stuff. Cool. Does uh, Mocha Pro slow down when you add a lot of rotos? Um, it, it does uh, a little bit, um, but you're starting to, you know, you have to um, add quite a few shapes for it to, to, to really start to feel it. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, uh, in a normal sort of day-to-day -day environment, you, you probably wouldn't notice, um, notice the big slowdowns at all. I see. Cool. Uh, let's see. Could you quickly repeat the planar grid demonstration? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so what the, uh, let's, let's take the uh, body here. Actually, let's take the track down here. Um, yeah, when we've got the surface turned on, let's bring this over so we can actually see the surface. Uh, and we'll turn on my tracks. And turn on the front. There we go. Cool. I'll turn everything else off. And zoom us in a little bit more. There we go. Good. Yeah. So when we've got the um, the surface turned on here, what this is doing is this is describing the um, uh, the shape that we've tracked in. So if we turn our grid on here, this is this is just another way of uh, of visualizing this surface. So the grid itself, you can't actually you know uh, you know change or do anything. It's it's entirely linked to our um, Let's unlock that. It's entirely linked to our surface. Um, I have also got everything locked up very nicely. So only by moving the surface do we actually start to move the uh, the grid up, because it's it's really it's a, a, a very cool visualization uh, tool uh, for when you can't quite see the the edges of the surface, or if you're wanting to um, uh, to come in. Let's uh, take my viewer preferences up. If you're wanting to sort of really uh, get a, a good grip on on where the the edges do sort of extend out to. You can sort of just play around with the uh, the grid area there. Um, a very very useful tool for, for visualization. Um, because it's slightly bigger uh, than the surface itself, it's a lot easier to see the sort of small minor um, you know troubles that you, you get into wobbles that you get into when your tracking data is not 100%. Cool. Is it possible to export 3D track to 3ds Max? If it takes in the FBX, um, then yes. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure if it does that because the only camera data we can take out uh, are, is you know .fbx files and uh, for uh, and uh, After Effects files. And the After Effects files are 
uh, only readable if you've got the uh, the the plugin as well. Um, so that's that's something to 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 think about. How many adjustment keyframes in Mocha to mask the spout? Uh, that's actually a very good question. I can't remember. Let's have a look. Because um, I also did this in a slightly different way. Uh, I think my original track on this one did... Uh, boom, 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 where's my spout coming in? Let's turn the lock off on that. Let's take one keyframe. One, two. Yeah, two keyframes to mask the spout out. Uh, and that's because the change in perspective uh, is quite um, significant, sort of halfway through with the uh, the top of the spout there. So we do have a we're we're sort of tracking in multiple planes, but it's a simple simple enough shape to to take out just with those two keyframes. Cool. How did you get the red X points on your corners, the ones you were keyframing? Oh, that's in the adjust track. Um, and that's that. Those those pop up, but only in the uh, only in the adjust track. So, uh, boom! There we go. That's where they are. Uh, and these are just the the things that we're adjusting to. Um, there's there's tons more stuff you can do in the adjust track. You can set different uh, reference points so that we're not sort of locked into the exact corners of the um, of the surface. Um, if if something goes you know out of frame. And you, you can't see if it's if it's good anymore. What we could do is we could set a new reference uh, point on this and sort of drag it over to you know maybe this area on the uh, the label here, so we can check to see whether this label stays steady. Uh, and if this label stays steady here, then we know we've got a good uh, good track going on down here as well. If not, we can start to slightly adjust things up there, and it's going to translate that. To our main surface corner point, um, it's it's again it's another really sort of useful tool for um, for getting the best possible sort of tracking data out. Cool. Um, it would be great if you can have the possibility to change the color of the grid. Is that possible? Uh, no, not as far as I know. Let's see. Would using the X plus spline tool to track different uncovered sections of the milk garden be faster than masking a garbage mat for the teapot spout? Oh, I we'll see what you're getting on. Yeah, bas basically, um, uh, what this this thing here is, uh, yeah, sort of doing multiple different shapes. There, uh, it's probably about the same sort of time. I think you know if I was doing this. Um, in a more structured way for, for a proper job, I probably would have started with the teapot first. Um, but because of the way I wanted to sort of present everything, uh, it actually made a lot more sense to start with the milk carton first, even, even though it's obviously further back uh, in space than the teapot is. Um, so, you know, if we get, get this stuff, the front stuff, rotoed out first, um, it means that we don't have to draw in as many um, track mats for the, uh, for the side here. Because if I had my teapot already rotoed, you know, I could just do the big one big uh, uh, side um, area here, side shape here, and track that in, just like I did with the wall, uh, and just track that in with the track mat over on the uh, the, the front part of the uh, the milk carton. I see. So it's more an, an artistic an artistic choice rather than a practical choice. <laughs> 